Semi-Pelagianism is defined uh, by, uh, just to take two authoritative texts, the concise Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church, while not denying the necessity of grace for salvation, maintained that the first steps towards the Christian life were ordinarily taken by the human will and that grace supervened only later. Grace supervened only later. So, um, the human nature all on its own, unaided, could accept the gospel message, a person be converted, and um, grace would come as part of like a sanctifying process, something like that. The Evangelical Dictionary of Theology explains that the semi-Pelagians affirmed that the unaided will performed the initial act of faith. The unaided will performed the initial act of faith. So this is what's commonly described as semi-Pelagianism. And uh, so I want to analyze this against the eight canons of the Second Council of Orange. Uh, and in the interest of time, let's just take a couple of them. And let's see if this is what Cashin and company really believed. Well, let's take number one here. If anyone says that the whole person, that is, in both body and soul, was not changed for the worse through the offense of Adam's transgression, but that only the body became subject to corruption with the liberty of the soul remaining unharmed, then he has been deceived by Pelagius' error and opposes the scripture. Well, okay, um, looking at Cashin, Vincent, and Faustus, neither of those three guys would say that the fall didn't affect human nature in any even drastic way. They did believe in a drastic fall. Uh, but the question is, to what extent? To what extent did the fall harm and damage human nature? Let's look at number five. Uh, if anyone says that, like its growth, the beginning of faith and the willingness to trust by which we believe in him, who justifies the ungodly and attain the regeneration of holy baptism, is present in us naturally and not through the gift of grace, dot, 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 uh, what happens here with many of the canons is you get the, uh, um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the grammatical term for the three dots. Ellipsis. Thank you, ellipsis. Um, you have the ellipses, is that the plural? Uh, ellipses in these canons, and then in the end it says, let them be an anathema or something like that. Uh, so here, if the beginning of faith and the willingness to trust is present in us naturally and not through the gift of grace. Okay, well... Wait a second. Faustus explicitly argues that man retains what I call natural free will. All right. So does this mean it can, you know, it goes in uh, contrast to Faustus's teaching uh, and, and basically saying he's a heretic? Well, actually, no, because there's a conjunction here. Present in us naturally and not through the gift of grace. Recall for Faustus, what I call natural free will is the prima grazia. It's the first grace. For Faustus, it's both the grace of God and human free will. It's not an either or disjunction. Okay? It's not present in us uh, naturally um, and not through the gift of grace. It's that, hey, if you think it's there naturally, but it's not the grace of God. That's what is to be rejected. Uh, for Faustus, he believed it was the grace of God. So, on a, if we have to be technical, if we're really just trying to get down to the truth here, five does not accurately describe Faustus's view. Now, whether that's the intention of the council here is a point of debate. What, what was Caesarius's view and was he intending to critique Faustus and his followers? Maybe we need to reopen the debate and say, hang on a second. Maybe the Second Council of Orange is addressing something else. Maybe it's not, though. Maybe Caesarius was really trying to defeat Faustus and his followers. But if that's the case, number five is a straw man. Number five does not accurately describe Faustus. Let's look at number six. If anyone says that mercy is divinely bestowed on us when, without God's grace, we believe, desire, try, labor, pray, watch, apply ourselves, ask, seek, and knock, 
but does not confess that the bestowal and inspiration of the Holy Spirit brings on us the strength to believe, to will, or to do these things as we ought, dot, dot, dot. Well, wait a second here. If anyone says that mercy is divinely bestowed on us when without God's grace, okay, well, it doesn't apply. It doesn't apply to Faustus. It doesn't apply to Vincent. And it doesn't apply to John Cashin. They all believed in the necessity of grace for every good action. So, the question is about how this grace functions. Uh, and is it a successive view, God's grace, then human nature? Or is it a different view, one that I think is the case, a concurrent view? It's a both and. It's not neither or. In Augustine, we see this either or uh, disjunction. Uh, in multiple writings over his career, he talks about this problem that he thinks about. And he, uh, he says here, uh, in, in trying to answer this question, uh, looking at Romans 9 specifically, of course, the controversial passage in Romans 9, uh, in answering this question, I have tried hard to maintain the free choice of the human will, but the grace of God prevailed, Augustine writes. Uh, in a letter to Sixtus of Rome in 418, he uh, also says, what merit then has a person before grace which could make it possible apart from a super added act of, uh, or sorry, I skipped a line there. One moment. Could make it possible for him to receive grace when nothing but grace produces good merit in us. And what else but his gifts does God crown when he crowns our merits? Basically saying, Augustine is saying, it's all God, everything. It's all, it's all divine. Um, on grace and free will, which he wrote to the monks at Hadromedum, chapter 33. God then works in us without our cooperation, the power to will. But once we begin to will and do so in a way that brings us to act, then it is that he cooperates with us. But if he does not work in us the power to will and does not cooperate in our act of willing, we are powerless to perform good works of a salutary nature. Wow. To me, that's very consistent with what today uh, we recognize as Calvinism. Uh, so I'm happy to say here that I think Calvinism is consistent with the later Augustine's view, uh, the later Augustine's view, not the early Augustine. Hi there, my name is Kurt Jarris. I'm an evangelical theologian, and I've come to realize that Bart Ehrman is correct. <laughs>